Good. Philippians chapter 2. Chapter 2. We have done it. We have done the impossible. God is in our midst. <clears throat> All right. Um, let's just go ahead and read verse 1. <clears throat> We're going to read 1 through 11. <clears throat> If there be therefore any consolation in Christ, any comfort of love, any fellowship of the Spirit, if any tender mercies and compassions fulfill you my joy that you be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord and of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem others better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore, God hath also highly exalted him and given him a name, which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven, and things in earth, and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. <clears throat> now those of you who have been in the Bible school here uh, for two semesters or more, then you <clears throat> know that I've been sort of on this theme of life out of death been really preaching this, this theme. <clears throat> and uh, I've been preaching it as God's way to victory. And um, anyone who knows me knows that this is just a real solid part of, of my comprehension of, of Jesus, of Christ. And uh, to preach life out of death includes things like not defending yourself. For example, Jesus being falsely accused and that by many, many witnesses who appeared not false. That's the key. Falsely accused by people who don't appear false but are able to make you appear false. And also, life out of death, referring to when attacked, loving them instead of doing the same thing that they would do to you. Um, because if you do the same thing, then you're no different than they are. You're of this exact same kind. And you've got no right to stand up for you. You need to stand up for them, too, because they're just like you. You get my point and how I'm coming at that. Um, and to that, that life out of death involves, the death part involves laying down on the cross that they make for you. Laying down on the cross that they make for you and to take the blows and to do it in the Lord, do it in the Spirit of Christ and to do it in faith, not just do it. I hope you understand that, that aspect of doing it in faith. Um, some of you who've been around a good long while know that it's been 12 years. 12 years. 12, 
12 long, hot years of attack that I personally have been under in this church also. <clears throat> Most of it aimed specifically at me. And there's really been no break in the heat. I mean, for 12 years, there has been no break in the heat. And that has spread not just from this city, but to this country and other countries. And the only information that they get is what others have written. I've never written a, something to denounce them or to prove they're wrong or to do any of that kind of stuff. <clears throat> um, and it's sort of been amazing. Shorter than the last two weeks, shorter than the last two weeks, I've had six or seven people come to me. And this is uh, people who held major issues with me, uh, people who not only believed junk, but spread junk and held grudges and thought the worst. And in all of that time, I have not tried to justify or do anything. In fact, I have genuinely, and I'm, this, isn't to, this is nothing about bragging or anything. That I'm going to try to make a spiritual point on behalf of the Lord. Uh, not attack them back, but not only that, I have prayed and prayed diligently, but not in the way most people would pray, because most people would pray, Lord, get them, or shape them up, or, or Lord, just, you know. <clears throat> I've literally prayed for houses, for finances, for blessings, for everything. <clears throat> and I've done that strictly out of a faith that I hold in my being, a faith that is not a doctrine in the sense of just ha holding a doctrine. It is not a teaching to me. It is how I order my life, and I believe, and I believe. Now, you've heard me say this a few times over the last 12 years. I believe life comes out of death. Anybody ever heard me say something like that? Oh, yeah, you know, it's maybe, maybe not. <laughs> Um, and I believe that when you don't justify yourself, you, you know, and, and here's, but here's the thing now, and of course this is all going along with what we've been sharing and what we will be sharing, that um, if, if you, if they mean malice and abuse and are wrong and dead wrong and they have no proper spiritual ground to stand on, it's just meanness. You still take the blows. Because, not, not because this is an issue of what's fair or not fair, but it's an issue of what is sacrificial, what is Christ. That's, that becomes the real issue. Now, you're not going to do that, even if you believe this doctrine, unless you have faith in this reality in the Lord. Do you understand? Because you can't do it. You won't do it. You will, you will twist it and turn it until you find an excuse to get back at them or stop them from doing what they're doing or, or, or give them a dose of their own medicine. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I mean, all these things come up, and you, you know, many of us can hold our breath for a certain amount of time, you know, and we can go, okay, okay, but after a while, I've had enough! <laughs> and now, now they're going to pay. Now they're going to pay. They killed my wife and children and burned my home, and now I will hunt down every one of them. And I will so, cr never mind. <clears throat> or, because, you know, if, if you let it build up, and, and let's just listen carefully, if you let it build up, if it's not Christ, do you see that 
See what I'm saying? If it's not Christ, it'll build up like a fire, like a, like a pot of tea or something on the fire. And the more that fire burns, the more it starts churning and bubbling and wanting release. And that's where you hear in those old, and pee, you know, that's the steam, you know, letting off. And <clears throat> but by not letting off that steam, because it's not Christ in you, and you really don't believe this. And you, you, do you understand what I say when I say you really don't believe it? I'm not saying it's not one of your pet doctrines. I'm saying you don't believe it because you actually have to trust God. You ha you have to say God is my judge. Well, we've all we all say that. But what if that gets tested? Be not uh, what is it about the fiery trial? Think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to test you. Test what? To test the the gold which is Christ, or is it going to be the dross that comes to the front? And if you don't have a, if you don't, you know, like a, 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 a teapot has a little valve that you can let off steam so it doesn't blow. Okay. Well, I'm here to tell you that Jesus didn't have a valve because he wasn't boiling and bubbling and, you know, he didn't need a valve. Inwardly, he was handling this in the manner of God. He was handling, he understood the way of God. He had the nature which was the way of God. And they were before all time. They know what's really true. You know, we, you know, the, the scriptures go at great length in the New Testament to talk about the foolishness of the wisdom of the wise, not of sinners. I mean, I remember when that dawned on me one day. I said, this isn't just directly attacking sinners. This is talking about people who think they're smart, that have the wisdom of this world. And guess what? It works in this world. I've seen, great, I've seen businessmen that could always succeed in any economy and, I, and try to pastor a church, and they couldn't do it because God operates by different principles. It wouldn't work in, in that setting. Um, and so, you know, you, you're, you're believing this, but either you find a way to let off steam, which is usually going, releasing something that's not Christ towards somebody who you have issues with because of what they did to you. And you've let off some of that steam, but it hasn't changed you on the inside. And the truth is it never makes it better because for every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. Excuse my physics. <laughs> Sewn into the fabric of God's creation. For every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. <clears throat> now, we don't believe that. You know, now we believe that if, you know, if you're standing there and you've got this, you know, I don't know, a, a, a swing with a big person in it and you push them and then you keep standing there, you'll believe it when it comes back and knocks you down. But you won't believe it in terms of the actual guy, creator, that created that based on spiritual reality. So we got to push back. And uh, when you do, every time you push back, you take some off of what was going to come, the resurrection. Do you understand what I'm saying? Because you, you, you siphoned off a little death, or a lot, depending on how far you react. And so you have sown something when you let off steam. You've sown something when you do that. Do you realize that? And when you sow a seed and that thing produces and comes up with, seed, with a plant and fruit, does it just produce one seed? No, you plant a seed, and depending on what it is, for example, a sunflower, you get a bunch of seeds. And so we start digging a hole. We dig a hole really and truly and honestly only for one reason, only for one reason, 
It wasn't Christ. It wasn't Christ. We have, we have set in motion something that will come back to us. And when it comes back, we can call it persecution. And especially if it comes from the person that we let the steam off to. You know. Well, they're persecuting me even more. Can you believe it? No, this specifically is not persecution. This is what you sow. This is your just reward. I almost said just desserts, but I would never put desserts in that category. <laughs> Unless I don't eat dinner and I have just desserts, then that's okay. <clears throat> this, this reality is incredible because God really is in control. Now that's the question. Do we really believe God is in control? And we all say religiously and smiling and looking very holy, yes, we believe God is in control. You know, I wonder how many times God looks in on our services and just goes, I can't look, you know. You know. <laughs> and just turns away. You know, I, I believe that that's kind of where the category falls in, where he says, I'd rather you be hot or cold, because if you're lukewarm, I'll spew you out of my mouth. Many people translate that, throw you up, you know, <clears throat> because you're supposed to be mine. You know, say, why don't you do that over the cold? I expect that from them. You claim to be you know, in there. Um, if I could tell you the stories of all these, and I won't, but if I could, many of them would blow your mind, but before I go any further, I will say, no, it's probably not who you're thinking about. Because guess what? With resurrection, doesn't mean everybody turns. It doesn't. Some do. Everything doesn't come up roses, but everything does start coming up Christ. God starts moving. Change happens. A, the, as far as God is concerned, the winter is over, and now he's going to start standing up because wherefore God hath highly exalted him. Wherefore comes in between all that Jesus went through, and because he did, and he did it in the right way, wherefore God hath highly exalted him and given him a name above every name, that at the name of Jesus. So here's what we do. We say, oh, that name, Jesus, it's, it's so special. He had that name before he died. All right? The angels came and worshiped and, you know, told them what the name would be and all this kind of stuff. There was all this stuff going on. But now, not really at the name of Jesus, but at the name of the guy whose name is Jesus, at the, at the guy's name, whatever it is, who believes in life out of death, God hath highly exalted him, and his death was deeper than any death anyone else would ever die. Do you agree? So, it's going to be higher. The lower, the higher. Does that make sense? The lower into the depths of hell, the higher the resurrection. So, um, So I'm saying all of this because for 12 long years you've heard me talk with no fruit and I could see some of you maybe, maybe not, thinking, yeah, well, it don't seem to be working out for you. And, and I'm honest, if I could tell you the stories, if I could tell you and give you all the particulars, you would be amazed. You would be amazed. So, uh, why, why would I take the time to share all that? Because we're going into chapter 2. 
because we are um, going to be introduced to the author of this way and the finisher because it's him in us, isn't it? I mean, it has to be him in us, you know. Uh, and let me just, you know, let me just add a few other things. I was thinking about it the other day. Actually, I was thinking about it before all this happened. So it was about three weeks ago. I was thinking about the scripture that says, the Lord says, I will prepare a table for you in the, in the presence of your enemies. And I thought, and I said to the Lord, what, what good is that? I mean, you know, I mean, I, I mean, I sort of thinking through it, and I thought, what good is that? If they're still your enemies, what, you're going to gloat and stuff? That's not Christ, so that can't be one of your joys of, you know what I mean? I mean, what is the joy of him preparing a table for you in the presence of people who would come over the table and strangle you, but the tables have turned now by God. Anybody catching that? And I'm thinking, he's saying to me, well, it's about time you came to that. where when resurrection came, you weren't there to gather any gloating or any superiority. In fact, you feel just like you did before. Lord, I just want to go into deeper death for a greater resurrection, a greater increase of Christ for others. And so... Resurrection surely comes just like seasons come, just like the sun comes up, just like it goes down into darkness, it comes up into great light. So these, they're, they're, it's going to happen if, if you're with Christ, if you're in that nature, if, you're, if you've worked through all of the kinks and justifications that our mind comes to for not truly going into a death that trusts itself. You know, Jesus on the cross, at the last moment, it's darkness on the face of the earth. He's already cried, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And now his la some of his last words are, into thy hands I commend my spirit. The total reality that I am, I'm t I have no more control. I can't move my hands to do anything. I can't move my feet to do anything. I can't think straight with these crown of thorns sticking into my head. I'm with you. I'm coming to you in death. I believe that there is a resurrection and that you are going to see to it that that happens. All right. If somehow I could just paint a picture, because I tried to with those, all of what I've said up to this point, but if there was some way I could just paint a picture of the difference between talking about this or writing about it and, or reading about it or listening to it and actual, genuine, fiery furnace seven times hotter than you've ever had and still be with the Lord. And let me just make this clear. That doesn't mean every second you were with the Lord. For the, about the first couple of years, I was like struggling, struggling, knowing where I should be and wasn't because I was, I was fighting feelings and, uh, you know, and a lot of the feelings are the same old things we all go through. This is unjust. This isn't fair. This is, you know, all this kind of stuff. Forgetting that these things are not about what's just or fair. They are about something much, much higher And so, I wonder, and it makes me bow my head and my heart for you, so that we are with the Lord in the way that he wants us to be with him. I just, you know, because it's so easy. We're so human. 
we constantly react. We constantly have our opinion. We constantly go against the Lord for our own opinion, but don't even have a clue we're going against the Lord for our own opinion because we're so settled in having our own opinion, our own way. I mean, it's just true. It's true. It's true of me. It's true of you. It's true of all of us. We've just settled into this earth. And uh, so I want you to know that my heart's with you and my, my searching is not for myself alone, but for you, for us, for us, for us, not for you, for us, for us. That we may, um, you know, what, the way uh, the way Paul said it was just excellent. Whether they're preaching junk that's a, adding affliction to me and making my burden even more heavy, or they're preaching Christ with a good heart, much every way I rejoice and do rejoice. For I know that this shall turn to my salvation through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ according, this is all in accord with my earnest expectation and my hope that in nothing I should be ashamed, but that with all both, not in death nor in life, I would be ashamed. That's, that's, remember, that's what he was saying. That in nothing I'd be ashamed. And the, the contrasting poles of what he's talking about, the areas of being in shame, is by life or death. I can live my life. I can live a Christian life for Jesus, but I don't want to be ashamed when the death comes and I can't allow Christ. And I stand before God ashamed that I reached out the arm of flesh. Um, All right, let's move on. Uh, let's look at verse 1 and 2, particularly verse 1. If there be, therefore, any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any tender mercies and compassion, fulfill you my joy that you be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord and of one mind. What is Paul trying to say there? What is, what is he trying to communicate? What is the thing? Why would he take the time to write these words? What is the meaning behind the words? Is he just talking? Is he just saying religious things that really don't have any meaning and there's, no, there's really no need to look any deeper because they're just religious words that we say um, or are they you know the, the the wording that I've used a long time ago are, are they pregnant with reality anybody have a comment on them yes okay you want to elaborate or evaporate Consolation of love, if there's any fellowship of the Spirit, if there's any affection and compassion, make this complete by being. So he's just encouraging more. If there's any encouragement, if there's any consolation, if there's anything in love, just like you would make a pattern. And like I was telling Weston last night, if you're going to, you know, you're going to read that book, what to expect when you're expecting. This is what he's telling you. If this is what we're going to live by, this is a pattern. So this is it. Okay, good. Somebody else? Okay, I'll just read a few of my notes so that seeing how we're almost half through. And <laughs> Paul starts this chapter by relating to the Philippians what his view is concerning how the Christian life should be manifest in the lives of those who claim to follow Jesus. This is, I'm relating that to the whole chapter. What is it that we see in verses 1 and 2? Do we see Paul describing the way Christians should act? Is he setting forth the moral character of God's kingdom? 
Is he trying to get Christians to get along better? What is he trying to communicate? And what is the meaning of these verses? And I think uh, that little phrase that I use there is he's setting forth the moral character of the kingdom of God. I believe that there are probably a multitude of preachers and teachers who would say that's what this is about. It is setting forth the moral character of the kingdom of God. First, he talks about the gains. Listen, listen carefully. First, he talks about the gains we have made as a result of this self-giving way. But he points to them and says that they also should live this way. For example, if we gain any encouragement by Christ crucified, or gain any comfort from his selfless giving, or if we claim to share in the same spirit, or have received any compassion or sympathy from God because of Christ giving himself on the cross, then allow for that same kind of mind to be at work in you, functioning by the exact same kind of love by being in full accord and one mind with this mind of Christ. That's what he's saying. He's saying, if you've gotten anything from the cross, if you've gotten anything from Jesus' death, if he's comforted you in any way through the selflessness of this sacrifice, you need to have the same mind, the same kind of love that went, and he'll describe it next, in the following verses, won't he? He'll, he'll get so specific that it's incredible. He's describing the depth of the love. The love wasn't just, I love you, and, you know, I, I love you. I'm sitting on the throne in heaven, and I'm going to send an angel, and he's going to comfort you. Jesus came down, and the kind of love he had gave himself for people who didn't deserve anything. Now, to this point, in chapter 1, Paul has described his experiences. He's described the manner in which he's proceeded. And he's made sure that we understood this was all by Christ. But he's really spelled a lot out a lot of what he's trying to communicate in specific, uh, uh, um, uh, a specific picture of this. But now, when it comes time to, for them, when he really turns it to them and says, I want to talk to you about this. He doesn't talk about himself anymore. He immediately takes them to the cross. And as you know, we read at the beginning of this, you know, beginning of the verse 5, let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. And he begins to, to describe that. And, and so in verse 2 he's saying, you know, um, be like-minded, be one accord of one mind. Let this mind be in you. All right. Now, if, if that's the true explanation of, of what he's saying here, then Paul is clearly saying it's not enough just to get saved by and, and, benef and get the results and benefits of this kind of life and way. You need to be exactly that way. See, he didn't. He didn't say, well, Jesus is above everybody else and there ain't, you know, ain't nobody like Jesus. Ain't nobody like Jesus. You know? <laughs> ain't nobody like Jesus. You know? <laughs> well, there is nobody like Jesus, but you are his body. And it ain't like Jesus. You are his body. And you have this same mind. And you have this same Jesus. You have this same spirit. I mean, I remember when I was in Bible school, I mean, you know, I talked to, I talked to my father, I talked to the Lord a lot, I talked to the Holy Spirit, you know, and I, I, I wrestle with stuff, so, you know. And he's telling me, you know, well, da -da -da, you need to be this way and do this and have this spirit and everything like that. And then it says something in the scripture I was looking at, you know, for the Son of God, and I said, well, yeah, of course he did it, Father, he's the Son of God. And the father said, just as clear to me, maybe it wasn't verbal or audible, but I heard it. He said, just as clear to me, well, what do you think you are? 
You're a son of God. By Christ. And I went, well, it can be done through me. Not that I do it, but it can be done through me. It can be. But the important thing I really want to bring out right now is Paul, the writer of the New Testament, is absolutely, positively not letting them off the hook. He has spent the whole first chapter describing how it's affected his life, how this Jesus, how this Christ crucified, how this cross has mo not just saved him and redeemed him, most of what he's described is like a lump of clay that has been molded after the pattern of Christ, that has been molded into an image. And now, now Paul turns and he doesn't point to himself anymore. He just says, I'm one of many. If there's anything that you've received concerning comfort or, or, or uh, uh, encouragement or all these things, then you need to let this same thing be in you. The same selfless way, the same selfless spirit, the same self-giving mind, the same thing. Folks, that's a whole lot more. What was the wording that I used? That's a whole lot more than setting forth the moral character of the kingdom of God. That is a whole lot more than set. It's not talking about the moral character of the kingdom of God. It's talking about the life and nature of the king. Who lives in you? Not, we we you know we take the king out of well we leave him in there but we make sure that it doesn't get specific to us so we say kingdom so that it's sort of ethereal and you're the moral character yes yes high standards no not high standards impossible standards so he gives you his life the king's life in you the governor governs in you. I mean, anybody got a problem with the governor governing? This is not political. <laughs> We're not talking about Rick Perry for president. <clears throat> we, this church does not endorse Rick Perry for president. <laughs> I'm teasing you folks. <clears throat> All right, so let me just make sure I've read some of this. <clears throat> uh, All right, so we, we read verse five, let this mind be in you. So we know that the mind that it's talking about so I wrote, Paul is saying that they should not just believe in a cross for their benefit. Mm, not just believe in a cross for their benefit. That's a huge portion of Christianity. They only believe in the cross for their benefit. That's what they preach on Sunday. That's what they write about. You say, well, how do you know? How do you know the vast majority? Go to the Christian bookstore, for God's sake. Look at some of the titles. Read the little insert. Look at the table of contents. It's, you know, doesn't take long. You say, well, every book, do you, you know, I don't know about every book. But I know that most of them are not referring to the king. They're at best referring to the kingdom. And I know that <clears throat> huge portion is about the cross as it benefits you. Okay? So I'll read it again. Paul is saying that they should not just believe in a cross for their benefit, but should, take, but should take on that same kind of mind in relation to others. Didn't verse 2 start, or verse uh, 3 and 4 start bringing up others? In fact, what's the last word of verse 4 in the King James? No, not mothers. Others. <clears throat> that mind not only involves shunning vainglory, but also allows for something to be in them that was not previously there. Okay? 
Uh, well, not, that may sound real simple, but basically we're talking about it's not about stopping doing things. It's, all, it's about gaining something or someone or the mind of someone, which is Christ. It is a receiving of something that wasn't there before. Um, I wrote, in fact, it's not automatic, it's salvation. Okay. If the mind of Christ, he's saying, let this mind be in you, right? He's saying, if you've gotten anything from it, you need to give out from it also. Right? Isn't that really the, the spirit that he's saying? So he's saying that, but he's, if it's not automatic at salvation, then that means there are a lot of people who are saved who are living on, only according to the benefits to get what they can get from Christ's death. Wouldn't that be a little bit like having a rich relative and you go to the funeral and everything just to be in on the will reading to get what you can get based on their death? Now, I don't know where you come from, but down here, <laughs> You know, actually, Adam is Adam anywhere you go. You know, the deal is, you, you know, you don't vulture off of the dead. You don't pick the bones of the dead. You might receive something that someone who loved you left you, but you don't go there to pick the bones of the dead. My Tom Anderson. <laughs> I told you my wife's going to sell that to bury me and pull these teeth. By the way, how many days ago was it that I mentioned the gold? It, pro last week, probably. It's 1842 6 or something. It's jumped several hundred dollars just since a couple of days ago. <clears throat> um, so load your guns and hunt me like the dog that I am. You know, it, that, that deal where that hammer smashed in my mouth is looking awful good now. <laughs> it's like, that might have been God. <laughs> okay, sorry. Sorry we get off here. I'm glad we don't have everybody coming through Skype because I'm a little out there sometimes. <clears throat> All right, so... Um, uh, so that, that mind not only involves shunning vainglory, but also allows for something to be in them that was not previously there. The mind of Christ, this is a message for Christians. Do you see it? Because they, they got the benefits, now, but they didn't automatically get the mind. But now he's saying in verse 5, let, let this mind be in you. Let. Let is not a doing word, it's a yielding word. It's not, something you, it's not something you work for and worry over. It's something you yield to. You just say, put it in me, Daddy. Put it in me, Father. And you, but here's, here's the real truth. Here's the real man. You say, Father, I want to yield to that kind of mind. I don't want to just be a benefactor, Father. I want to be like you. I want to be like Jesus. I want to be like, I want to be like the family. I want that. You have to want it. He won't put that in you automatically. You can live for 15 or 50 years as a Christian and still be self-centered trying to get all you can from the dead guy, Christ crucified. Amen? And not see anything wrong with it until we put it in terms like that. And then you go, oh my God. We're vultures. <laughs> so there is a yielding, there is a letting. Lord, in other words, there, you, to do that, you have to come into agreement with it. 
You can't fight it. Now, I know that I, I know that we all fight it. Paul fought it. I fought it. But I'm saying there comes a time where you've, God just keeps showing it to you. This is what happens. You start tipping the scales. I mean, at first, your, your, your carnal mind has all the weight with it. And then you've got a few little nuggets from the Lord, so your scales go, Beep. you go, oh, I'm really growing. You know? Beep. And then, you know, of course, sometimes then, you know, something happens, then it goes, Beep. your carnal mind gets more weight that goes back. You have to keep going until there's a, a slippage and where there's, there's more reality of this so that you begin to say, not my will but thine be done. And you know exactly what you're praying. It's not, you know, we, see, we do that. We go, okay, Lord, I don't really, you know, I, I want this job, this I want to be a cruise director on a cruise ship. Lord, just strike whoever said that. My eyes were closed. I know not who it was. But then, but then we say, you know, but, you know, if you're, you know, if, if it's going to have to be a job working for the city or whatever, not my will, but thine be done. And we think we're so spiritual for that. You know, I mean, those are win-win situations, you know. But it's like one's like really big win and one is, you know, okay, but, but we're spiritual. Not my will, but thine be done. I mean, those working for the city or the state, you know, you get regular raises and benefits, but not my will, but thine be done. And we just really think we're so spiritual, and I'm not trying to be mean or anything like that. And when I say all this kind of stuff, that, that I have no malice or meanness going on in me. I have one reason for saying it. That's us, all of us, me, you, that's us. Let's face it, look at it, and go, okay, well, but as long as we're hiding, you know, what does it say about the true fast? Sorry, and somebody's teaching on fasting, that one of the things of a true fast is you don't hide yourself from your own flesh. Have you already addressed that scripture? Okay, well, I won't, I won't re-preach it. But stop hiding yourself from your own flesh. <laughs> I'm not really preaching that. It's just in the mouth of two or three witnesses. <clears throat> you say, yeah, but those witnesses are you and Telly. You're sort of dumb. It's in the mouth of two or three witnesses. <clears throat> if it's the Lord, receive it. You know, Shay warned me of this, didn't you? He said, how are you doing? I said, I didn't sleep with a flip last night. I am so tired. I've probably looked like I'm dying up here I, I just didn't sleep at all and it's been a long day because I got up early and and so Shay said well class ought to be funny tonight and I said, why are you saying that he says well usually when you're tired you're more funny than <laughs> he says that's normal of anybody you know except Mike Wallace <laughs> ask Patty when he gets tired he's just mean <laughs> not really Yeah. <clears throat> All right. Am I getting anywhere in this? <clears throat> All right. This change is not some new approach to life that we call self selflessness. I mean, the cha the change that we're calling for is not a new approach to life that we call selflessness but is a participation in the very mind of Christ concerning how to live this life in Christ based solely upon Christ crucified. All right, do you see the difference? Because I, I just made a division there. There's a difference. I drew a line in the sand. On one side is, uh, I'm going to draw a cross representing Christ crucified, not just representing the cross and not just representing the historical event that happened 2,000 years ago, and we'll get into all that eventually in this class. 
are, are in this course. And then the other side, we're just gonna, you know, for lack of a better way, I'll just draw an altar here and call it selflessness. We're not calling for selflessness. Paul is not calling for selflessness. He's calling for the mind of Christ, which is selfless. He's calling for the same mind, the same spirit, the same, what, what was all the wording there? The same, if any, you know, tender mercies, any fellowship of this spirit, be like-minded, have the same love, be of one accord, of one mind. It's not just selflessness. It is letting, thank you, letting the mind of Christ be formed in you. Okay, well, that's, that's vastly different from hearing somebody teach about these things and coming away with some sort of a concept that, well, we, I need to be more selfless. I need to be more giving. I need to, I need to not be so fixed in my positions and stuff like that. Well, good, you can, you can change that. You know, there are a lot of people who are just real flexible. You're not, but there are people like that. They're just real flex. They'll, they just, you know, flow and everything. But they're not doing that by Christ either. You see, they're, they're selfless, but it's them. But they're not truly selfless. You know? I started to give, it, give an example from the orphanage where, you know, some kid doesn't do what the the house parent says, goes over there and beats on him. Another kid walks by and says, says, you go do this then. You go over there and do this thing. Go mop that floor. And he goes, yes, Masa, yes, Masa. And he goes over there and he mops it and he does it, you know, does it good and he leaves. You could look at that and say, well, now there's a good kid. That other kid was just bad. But all he's doing is protecting himself. Do you see what I'm saying? I'm just using this as an example. Um, neither angle of that should give us any comfort. We should be ashamed and embarrassed that it's not Christ. I mean, you see what I'm saying? I mean, and, and I'm saying that totally on the basis that I believe that every one of you want more of Jesus. You want an increase of Christ. So I'm not, you, you see what I'm saying? I'm not laying something heavy on it. I'm just saying, in this place, we want Jesus. We, and I should normally, naturally feel embarrassed if I am knowingly aware that I'm doing things that are not gaining Christ at all, but are just protecting my flesh. Or even hiding myself from my own flesh. All right, so um, when we plug into Jesus, then we are able to obtain the same mind. What, what, what do you mean plug in? What are you talking about? You know. Well, if I got a, a coffee maker and it's not plugged up, I say, make coffee. I, I put stuff in you. I put the right stuff. You know, and I, I mixed all in, I ground up the, the beans myself. And I put it all in there and the, and the filter, everything's go. Come on, give me what I want. Well, it has no life, no power in itself. It's a dead machine. Does that make sense? Not, alone by itself, it just, you know, it's worse than that. It's like a stump. You know, you're a coffee maker. No, I'm just a, I'm just here. But you plug that sucker in, and the f pleasant fruits, of the sweet savor of the. <laughs> 
Whether that's a coffee maker or a blender or electric razor or whatever, doesn't matter. The point is, unless it plugs in to the grid that goes all the way to the power place that's inside of there, you know, I mean, it's got the power. Well, you don't got the power again, excuse my Texan. You ain't got no power. What do I got? Jesus. You got Jesus. Is that okay? No, I want the power apart from Jesus. I want to be a coffee maker that jumps up and goes, yeah, I can do all things through Christianity. Well, that's, what, that's usually the way we quote that. I mean, not with those words, but we really think I can do. That's what we get out of it. I can do all things. Christ. I mean, that's really how it's said. I, I can do. I'm a can do kind of person. I'm an American. I'm not an American. No. You are empty and foolish and absolutely worthless unless Christ be formed in you. As, certainly as a Christian, because you can't have a Christian without Christ. You only have a young. <clears throat> I almost want to just stop, but I want to finish this paragraph. And I think that this would be, while I'm finishing this, it'd be good to just, in your heart, just pray and say, God, don't let the same guy come back. <laughs> When we plug into Jesus, then we are able to obtain the same mind, resulting in the exact same love. Do you agree? Which results in ultimately exhibiting the same behaviors. The purpose for abiding, you know, because Jesus said, Abide in me, and I in you. I'm the vine, you're the branches. I got the juice, you're just a straw. You're the branch. Uh, the purpose for abiding is so that the principles that spawned the cross will be handed down as the same pattern for our life by virtue of oneness with Christ's mind and attitude of self-giving. Do you see that? I, I will go over that more later. But there's your explanation. There's the true explanation. There is... An eternal sentence with a, you know, as I said, pregnant with reality and a, from several different angles, a plethora of angles. Do you want me to read it one more time? Nope. Should have been listening the first time. <laughs> Now you're all going to hell. <laughs> and I don't wish it on you. <laughs> but clearly that's where you're going. All right. All right, I'll read it one more time. <laughs> the purpose for abiding is so that the principles that spawn the cross, the principles that spawn the cross, will be handed down as the same pattern for our life by virtue of oneness with Christ's mind and attitude of self-giving. Some of you are going, could you read it one more time? <laughs> what was the next word after the purpose? All right. Good luck. You're on your own. <laughs> We're dismissed.